Hi, geography students. This is part two of the uh, agriculture video lecture. We're going to take a little detour. We were doing the first, second, and third agricultural revolution. The last part of this chapter kind of divides it into two sections. First one is more about cadastral systems and village types, and the, and the last part is more on agribusiness and the, and the current trends in agriculture. So in terms of cadastral systems, these are ways of laying out property um, lines for individual households. So there's three main types of cadastral systems that are in the United States um, and North America. The most common is township and range. Sometimes you will refer to this as rectangular survey system. And it's based on sort of one square mile grids or sections that, that the, the land is divided into. Um, before we had township and range system, we actually had the meets and bounds survey system. This uses natural features like rivers or trees or um, perhaps even a, a mountain. And the problem with it is that if something happens to that natural feature, you've lost your property line or your, your way of keeping track of your property um, boundaries. So um, as a result of those problems, we developed the township and range system. One other type of cadastral system you'll see a lot, especially in French, former French territories, so like Louisiana, but also up in the maritime provinces of Canada, you find the long lot survey system. This usually once is, is, is trying to give everyone access to the river, so they may be more uh, agriculturally based where they need water for irrigation or also for transporting the goods. So these are some some images. The, the top one would be more what you'd see in long lot survey. Bottom would be the rectangular or um, township and range. And then this is the meets and bounds. And again, all of them sort of give you an idea of what the actual property boundaries, the language of it would look like. So this is a really good map showing you where you might find the different types of survey systems in the United States. Again, the majority are going to be that rectangular or township and range. Um, this, is, this is also what township and range might look from like an aerial photograph. It's very obvious that it's township and range in terms of the big squares that you see on the land. This would be showing you the long lot. Again, everyone has access along a river or a road. Um, and then the other way that you can not only divide up the land in terms of individual properties, you can also take multiple properties and, and lay out a village. So we're, we're going to talk about um, really, we're going to talk about five, actually six. I'm going to talk about six different agricultural villages. Um, most of these are pretty self-explanatory. Linear means it forms sort of a line along a river or a road. Cluster means it's nucleated or, or clustered around a certain area. Round or runling, um, again, form a circle. You find this a lot in East Africa with the, like the Maasai, where they build their houses in a circle around the cattle that they herd. Um, a walled village is exactly what it what it sounds like. There may be a wall, wall that runs through the town or around the town. Um, grid village uses grid lines, latitude, longitude lines to form sort of a grid pattern on the land and the and the buildings relate to that. And the last one is the dispersed settlement pattern. This is what you find more in the Great Plains of the United States where we have a farmhouse and a barn and then a long um, line of acres of land that they can farm on. And then you'll find another house and barn and then lots of acres of farmland. Um, you don't find this as much in other countries where the population may be much higher and there's not as much land to farm on. But in the United States, in the Great Plains, you'll find more of that dispersed settle settlement pattern. So again, one of the major things you're going to find within all villages, not only cities, but also small towns and villages, is that there is a social stratification that shows up on the village, both in terms of what material is being used to build the houses, but also in terms of the size of the buildings. And, and you can tell sort of what the importance of that building to the society, as well as perhaps the size of it can tell you um, whether certain people have more power or more wealth within that town. 
So the other um, idea here is, and you, this is just an example following along with what we said before, when you look at the buildings in Cambodia, all these houses look similar. They don't have a lot of differentiation in terms of the purpose or the materials being used. You can tell that everyone living within this area of the village is going to be somewhat equal in terms of their their um, social hierarchy. And again, this is showing you that dispersed settlement pattern you'll find in the Great Plains of the United States. So the last major part of this chapter has to do with agribusiness. And an agribusiness is going to be a one, one corporation that kind of controls all aspects of, of a particular product in agriculture. Obviously, these are all going to be dealing with commercial agriculture. So like we talked about subsistence agriculture in the other video, where people are trying to grow food simply to survive, commercial agriculture is where you are growing food to make a profit. That's the goal. So when you have agricultural or agribusiness, you're, you're certainly having one corporation that's trying to monopolize or at least control a large segment of that particular agricultural product and the production of that product so that they can get as much money as possible. This does stem from a lot of roots in colonialism where the European powers would force the natives to um, pay taxes and in order to pay taxes, they would then encourage them to sell commercial or engage in commercial agriculture and sell crops. And that's the way the world still works today. We also have advances in transportation and food storage. So this is um, those containerization that we talk about in industry and, and development even, but this specifically is those refrigerated containers. So you can have flowers picked one day and, it, and because the containers they're put in are refrigerated, they can be shipped a further distance and stay, stay fine and, and still be put in a florist three days later. So um, this, is a, this is something that you need to take a little bit of time on when you're studying for this test. It's a way to kind of see the connections or the relationships that exist between climate regions, namely in terms of temperature and precipitation, and the agricultural products that come from that climate because there is a lot of overlap that exists. So this map right here, I want you to learn specifically these particular types of agricultural um, products like cash crops or luxury crops, um, but also in terms of subsistence agriculture, where would you find that? Mediterranean agriculture is always um, a big uh, topic for the AP exam. So be aware of looking at these particular colors and where they're found in the world and then connecting it with Copen's climographic map where you can see what the connection is in terms of what the agricultural products might be and the type of climate you would find there because there is a correlation, there is a connection. Remember we talked about the fact that coffee grows in certain areas of the world and all of those areas have the same climate which is why they're able to grow coffee. But it's also why you won't find coffee being grown in places that don't have that climate. So those are the kind of connections I'm looking for. I want you to kind of look at these and, and feel comfortable with them. Um, also in terms of agribusiness, we want to um, talk about the, the effects it has had on the world, um, both on a national scale, but also on a global scale. So certainly it has impacted U.S. production in terms of like poultry, the poultry industry is very concentrated with only a few country companies that control all of the poultry industry in our in our country, but also um, that impact on manufacturing of. Um, remember, we talked about the fact that Tyson owns not only the farms where the chicken are chickens are raised, but also the processing plants where the chickens are are killed and the and the meat is extracted and then even the factories that make that chicken meat become chicken nuggets that you then buy at a grocery store all parts of that industry are controlled by certain companies that's agribusiness in response to agribusiness we have some effects so one of those is that small family farms can't really survive very well unless they engage in organic agriculture organic agriculture is something that um, is 
because of the way it is maintained and it has to be very carefully maintained so that there's no chemicals being used at all in the production of the crops that can that means that it can then be um, the price of those products will be higher so small family farmers if they can adequately um, control their agriculture to the point where it's organic, they can charge more for those crops, which means that they can make more money from them. So in response to agribusiness buying up all these small family farms, some family farms feeling threatened are moving into agriculture or organic agri agriculture. Um, so even though we have a reduction in the amount of, of farms in general, those farms are larger with agribusiness, but the smaller farms that we have are now engaging in more organic agriculture. So there's an increase in the amount of organic agriculture going on in the country. And also I would say in most core countries of the world. So this shows you just a map of the United States within terms of, of what's being um, grown organically. Um, the other sort of trend that happens within agriculture right now is the idea of fair trade. So this happens a lot with coffee or chocolate. Again, lux luxury crops that people with, with money, with expendable incomes, want um, a lot more of. But they want to feel good about um, buying those products. So fair trade is a way to make sure that small farmers, who are the ones that are actually doing all the work to grow the coffee or grow the cacao, are, the, are getting a fair price for those goods. So the corporation doesn't make a lot more profit than the, the farmers themselves. So if you want to feel better about helping those everyday farmers to be able to provide for their families and, and make some money, then you should you should buy and look for that fair trade um, symbol on, on packages of certain foods. Um, so this is a fair trade coffee farmer in El Salvador. Again, right along those same lines. Um, one of the major impacts that agribusiness has had is that of course we have less farms we also have less farmland available because of lots of different things but certainly the expansion of cities into our farmlands has meant that there's less farmland being farmed um, it's being bought up and used as as parts of cities the other thing that's happening on a city scale is that we have food deserts occur and what this is is it happens in low income um, in urban areas, urban neighborhoods, where grocery stores are typically not located. So in turn, the people that live in these low-income neighborhoods, all they can do is resort to going to convenience stores and getting processed foods that are high fat, high salt, high sugar. They're not healthy. They're not getting fruits and vegetables. They're not getting fresh meats. So um, that's a problem, and there needs to be sort of um, some attention that's being brought to this to help make sure that people in inner city neighborhoods can still get healthy food from their from their um, within their area. So we have community gardens arrive. We also have more grocery stores that are starting to to locate in low income neighborhoods. Um, typically, they might sell produce that's been bruised or it's not as pretty um so they can they can sell it for a lot less but then people in those low income neighborhoods have access to it so hopefully this has helped you feel a little better about the chapter overview for the test please remember to finish your study guide um, bring in questions that you have so that you can get those answered and also think about uh, going out to the College Board website and looking at the resources they have out there over Chapter 11 in Agriculture. Thanks so much for walking, watching. See you later.